Well, here we are in week 18 of 20, and tonight we'll be in 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, so let's get to it. I want to, before we begin our three-word synopsis, uh, tell you a little bit about the Thessalonians, some things that we can take out of what Paul said to them in, in these two letters. Uh, first of all, they are a persecuted church. They endured persecution, and uh, Paul mentions that in a, a, a few places in both of the letters. Uh, secondly, he talks about their love for one another. They they express brotherly love uh, well. And in fact, Thessalonica is in Macedonia. We talked about the Macedonian churches. Paul made a big deal about the Macedonian churches setting a good example for the Corinthians in their giving. Well, Thessalonians would be another group in that geographic region. So this is a church that is a good church. So first Thessalonians. The three-word synopsis, the second resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus was the first resurrection, and there's going to be a second resurrection. There's going to be a resurrection of the dead, those who are in Christ Jesus, those who are Christians, those who are saved, uh, and then die. Those who have died and those who will die before he returns will be resurrected when he returns, and that is the main message that he communicates, uh, and we'll talk more about that in just a minute, but let's get into some of the sub-themes first, beginning with encouragement. In a letter that is five chapters, Paul really takes the first three chapters to encourage the Thessalonians in uh, how they're doing. They're doing well, and he's he's happy for them. He's happy with them. Um it reads a little bit like a newsletter, almost like if Brother Jeff and Sister Nancy were sending us their ministerial newsletter, but it's not really news. It's more of him kind of reminiscing on his time with them and reflecting on the messages that he's receiving about them, that they're, they, that they're doing well. This is an encouraging letter to the Thessalonians. The first three of five chapters really deals with that theme. Then at the beginning of chapter 4, we get the theme of holiness. Uh, Paul instructs them to live a life of holiness. That is the Christian way, and it's the only way. It's not optional. And then uh, finally, at the end of the letter, we get another little section with just some general Christian instructions, things like pray, rejoice, give thanks, so forth, uh, a little section there. Embedded in all that, in, in between all that, in the end of chapter 4 and the beginning of chapter 5, is the main piece of theology for the letter. And that main piece of theology deals with the end times, and specifically the resurrection of the church, the resurrection of the dead in Christ. And so let's turn to that now and take a look. It's too easy to just simply say that this section is about the end times, as in a very generic way, just say this is about the end times and oh, the return of Jesus. It is about those things. But there's a specific question that's being answered here uh, that is an obvious question that the Thessalonians have for Paul. Uh, they are He is addressing a concern that they have that people who die, uh, Christians who die, would somehow miss out on the return of Jesus or miss out on something that those who are alive would get to experience. And so the question that he's answering is, what will happen to people who die before Jesus returns? And the answer he gives begins here in verse 13 of 1 Thessalonians 4. Let's read it together. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, in other words, who have died, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. In other words, uh, Christians who have died. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. We will have no additional benefit. Those who are alive, I say we, uh, maybe I'll be alive or maybe I won't. But when Jesus returns, those who are alive will have no additional benefit over those who die uh, before he returns. And now 2,000 years worth of, of Christians who have died before he returns. And so he goes on to explain what will happen then. 
For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, remember that, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall be always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Okay, so get the picture here. Jesus comes. As he's coming, those who are dead are resurrected and caught up to meet him in the air. And those of us who are alive are caught up together. So both the dead who are now resurrected and the ones who were alive who never died together are caught up to meet Jesus in the air. Going on to the beginning of the next chapter. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord, that key phrase there, the day of the Lord refers to when, when the Lord comes. That day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains on, upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. That word wrath in verse 9 has been used and, and, and pointed out in many, many discussions on this. The wrath of God will be poured out in the last day on all those who have never come to uh, yield to him and hum to humble themselves before him and receive him as Lord and Master. The wrath of God will be poured out on those people. And Paul indicates that the wrath of God is not to be poured out on we who uh, do the right things, who humble ourselves, who, who, who uh, receive God's free gift of salvation, and who uh, follow Jesus as Lord and Master. The wrath of God is not reserved for those people. Now, there is a difference between the word wrath and the word tribulation. Uh, and so the wrath, uh, uh, the wrath is what God does to the bad guys. Tribulation sometimes refers to what God does to the bad guys, but it also often refers to what the bad guys do to the good guys. In other words, we have persecution and tribulations in this life. Um, and the great tribulation um, involves, in part, the bad guys doing bad things to the good guys. And so I want you to see a distinction there between the tribulation and the wrath of God. The wrath of God is not reserved for uh, those who follow him and are his children. So then the message of Second Thessalonians is to come back and add another layer to this discussion of end times. Uh, the question has been resolved in terms of the dead in Christ rising, so they won't miss out on anything. But now the question becomes, has Jesus already come? There's, there's some rumors circulating that the Lord has already returned. And Paul makes a point here of, no, the Lord has not returned, and don't, don't accept that kind of a message. And he gives us a piece of information, uh, something to look for. The Lord will not return unless or until something particular happens. And so let's turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, which is the meat of the letter, chapters 1, 2, and 3. Uh, chapters 1 and 3 sort of serve as a, uh, a, a, some sub-themes there. Uh, but chapter two is where the meat of the letter, where the main message of the letter resides. And that main message of the letter is after the abomination, after the abomination. And we'll explain what that means. So let's, let's take a look at second Thessalonians chapter two, and we'll see what Paul is getting at here with after the abomination. He says, now, dear brothers and sisters, let us clarify some things about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice we're talking about when Jesus returns and how we will be gathered to meet him. Again, emphasis on 
the Lord Jesus returns and we are gathered to meet him. We just talked about that in the previous letter. Don't be so easily shaken or alarmed by those who say that the day of the Lord, again, just another, there that, there's that phrase that's talking about the end times, Jesus returning at the end of time, and us being with him. Don't be alarmed by those who say that the day of the Lord has already begun. Don't believe them, even if they claim to have had a spiritual vision, a revelation, or a letter supposedly from us. Don't be fooled by what they say, for that day will not come until... There is a great rebellion against God, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the one who brings destruction. New King James says, son of perdition. He will exalt himself, remember that phrase, exalt himself and defy everything that people call God and every object of worship. He will even sit in the temple of God, claiming that he himself is God. Now, we're going to really tease this out quite a bit more, but let's go ahead and read on uh, the rest of this portion uh, of his, him explaining what happens when the Lord will return and who this man of lawlessness is. Verse 5, Don't you remember that I told you about all this when I was with you? And you know what is holding him back, for he can be revealed only when his time comes. For this lawlessness is already at work secretly. And it will remain secret until the one who is holding it back steps out of the way. Then the man of lawlessness will be revealed, but the Lord Jesus will kill him with the breath of his mouth, notice this, and destroy him by the splendor of his coming. In other words, this whoever this character is we're talking about will be destroyed when Jesus returns. In other words, we're talking about something that's in the future. Okay, going on. Verse 9, this man will come to do the work of Satan with counterfeit power and signs and miracles. He will use every kind of evil deception to fool, the, fool those on their way to destruction because they refuse to love and accept the truth that would save them. So God will cause them to be greatly deceived and they will believe these lies. Then they will be condemned for enjoying evil rather than believing the truth. We see here this man of lawlessness is going to exalt himself over, if, as if this is possible, exalt himself over the throne of God. Uh, Paul very clearly states that Jesus will not return until this happens. Okay, I want to bring in a couple other passes of, passages of Scripture now to uh, fill in some gaps here. Who are we talking about? What are we talking about? And first, we'll turn to Jesus' teaching in Matthew chapter 24, where he says this. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by, the, by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place. So we're going to look for this abomination of desolation, and we're going to look at Daniel and see what he's talking about there. When you see this happen, whoever reads, let him understand, verse 16, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on top of the house, uh, who is on the housetop, no, go down or take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation. There's that word. Such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. So there's nothing so bad is this that it's going to come afterward. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Notice this now in verse 29. Again, this is Jesus teaching. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels. Remember, we talked about the archangel uh, and the sound of a great trumpet. We saw that in Paul's letter as well. And they will gather together his elect. We saw that in First Thessalonians from the four winds and from one end of heaven to the other. Notice that this is immediately after the tribulation of those days, the Son of Man will come. 
In other words, Jesus will return. Okay, so what is this abomination of desolation? Well, there are actually previous abominations that have already occurred. And one thing we need to remember is in our prophetic literature, uh, Daniel is the one we're looking at right now. Uh, we'll look at it in just a second. There's often a near and a far fulfillment. In other words, there's, there's a fulfillment of that prophecy that happens earlier, and then there's another one that comes later. So the nearest fulfillment is when Antiochus IV uh, captured Jerusalem and sacrificed a pig to Zeus in the temple, 167 BC. So Antiochus desecrates the temple. This fulfills the prophecy of Daniel, the abomination of desolation. But this clearly cannot be the event that Jesus is referring to because Jesus comes after that. He's saying there will be something yet to come afterward. And so then we turn to the second uh, abomination of desolation. Many people point to the destruction of the temple. It doesn't, doesn't get much more uh, abomination and desolation than destroying the temple in 70, the year 70 AD. Um, so this is another kind of foreshadowing. It's, it's, it's an abomination of desolation, but it can't be the final one because Jesus said that when that abomination of desolation happens, immediately after that, He's going to return. And so since he didn't return uh, in AD 70, uh, that means that we're to expect a third, at least a third, uh, but a third fulfillment of this, a far fulfillment, the final fulfillment, which is right before he comes back. Okay, turning to Daniel now, let's actually see what Daniel wrote about this abomination of desolation. And this will shed a little bit more light for us in chapter 11. He says this, and forces shall be mustered by him and they shall defile the sanctuary fortress and then they shall take away the daily sacrifices and place there the abomination of desolation. Now we're talking about in the temple. Then in verse 36, the king shall do according to his own will. He shall exalt and magnify himself above every God. That is a very close wordage and verbiage to what Paul uses to describe. Uh, that this this uh, character, this son of perdition, this man of lawlessness will exalt himself over God and shall speak blasphemies against the God of gods and shall prosper, prosper till the wrath has been accomplished for what has been determined shall be done. Going on verse uh, in chapter 12, Then I, Daniel, looked, and there stood two others, one on this river, river bank and the other on that river bank. And one said to the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river. How long shall the fulfillment of these wonders be? Then I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river when he held up his right hand and his left hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it shall be for a time, times, and a half a time. A time, times, and a half a time. A time, that's one, times, that's two, and a half a time. So one and two and a half. So that's three and a half. In other words, we're talking about three and a half years or three and a half something. And we believe it to be years. We'll see why in just a minute. And when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, all these things shall be finished. Although I heard, I did not understand. Then I said, my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, go your way, Daniel. For the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Notice this is talking about the end times. Many shall be purified, made white, and refined. But the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand. But the wise shall understand. And from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Blessed is he who waits and comes to the 1,335 days. But you go your way till the end, for you shall rest and will arise to your inheritance at the end of the days. Notice 1,290 days, divide that by 365, you get approximately three and a half years. And it says that Daniel will rest, in other words, he'll die, and he will arise at the end of the days. So putting this together now, 
Paul is saying in Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians, this man of lawlessness, this whoever this character is that comes and desecrates the temple, uh, it will be after that uh, that the Lord will come. And Daniel says it will be 1290 days and 1335 days. Now, which one of the, uh, there must be a little extra period of something there. I'm not sure. But in other words, a three and a half year period. And then Daniel will rise at the end of those days. Well, if Daniel is rising at the end of those days, then that is when all of the church will rise in the resurrection. Summing up then, the message of First and Second Thessalonians together is the second resurrection after the abomination. The resurrection of the dead, the dead in Christ will rise when? After the abomination. We've really just scratched the surface on the end times. If you'd like to dig into this a little bit more, uh, about a year ago, maybe more, we put out a little pamphlet on what the Bible teaches about the end times. And if you're interested in that, just reach out. And we'd be happy to send it to you. Two weeks left. Next week, 1 Peter. And in week 20, we'll have 2 Peter and Jude. We'll see you next week.
Jesus, you are Lord, our rock, our core, and stone. 